All right, hi class. So we are in the establishing phase of the uh, church planting uh, phases, and uh, we are um, just after we've uh, you know started having a small groups where we've been meeting. We have uh, started our Sunday morning gathering. We've discussed uh, developing community partnerships. We've discussed starting new ministries in the church, like a kids ministry, uh, so things like that. And we've uh, also discussed uh, what kind of elements should be involved in the worship service. So we kind of talked about establishing those type of ideas and. Uh, uh, now, one of the key things that uh, really starts very early on in the uh, team development phase, when you're, you know, just moved to the area, you're starting to build a core group or a team, or maybe you're uh, recruiting, whatever that looks like, uh, you're going to be involved in developing new leaders and equipping them. And so, uh, we've talked a little bit about um, getting some team members ready and even some pre-development. Uh, what we're talking about in this particular uh, video lecture is more establishing a leadership development system for the those who are already in your church, for the those who are newly coming, uh, the new members that you are baptizing and getting into groups, and who are joining in the worship service, and so it's really just getting people from just you know, sitting participants um, or uh, s sitting uh, viewers to active participants. Okay, and uh, so today on this particular video, our big question is how will we develop new leaders uh, in the new church? And today we're going to look at establishing what's called a leadership pipeline to develop these leaders. So this is really a strategic path. We, we've discussed a discipleship pathway. In a lot of ways, this fits with the discipleship pathway idea. Uh, this is almost an extension of the pathway and often can be uh, interwoven into what a discipleship pathway looks like. So in your discipleship pathway, you know they, they come to Christ and they're baptized and they become discipled in a relationship. They're part of a small group type community of whatever that looks like for your church. And uh, they, they, they grow, they learn spiritual disciplines, they start... Um, understanding their spiritual gifts and how to use those in the church. And so in that discipleship pathway, you want them to understand, okay, well, how can I progress from uh, being a, uh, a church member uh, to maybe one of the team leaders? What would that look like for me? And you have to really think, not uh, everyone in your church, especially new believers, they're not going to have a Bible uh, college or seminary training. Um, and especially if you have people who have never been part of a church who come, uh, they're not going to have an idea of there. there's a way that they can uh, volunteer, a way that they can serve, and a way that they, they, the way that they can lead. Now remember, our discipleship pathway said, how do we get people to go from lost to leading? So this is really going to kind of finish that out and go into the leading part. And we're going to talk about developing a leadership pipeline, uh, how to get um, uh, every member involved some way in progressing through uh, different leadership stages. Okay, and this is a really, um, a really hot topic right now uh, for church revitalization. So for those of you who are in the class and you're really interested in revitalizing, I'm going to show you an example from a church in Winston-Salem, the Arsending Church, actually. That was a part of for several months, and uh, they were developing a revitalizing program based on developing new leaders, and uh, it's really exciting. And we, they're still putting it together, and so um, in a few months, hopefully, that will be, be ready. And it's going to actually start as a hub in North Carolina, for those of you interested. But there will be some online resources as well. Um, but the way that uh, my former pastor Rob Peters was really thinking was that the way to revitalize a church, yes, you're doing expositional gospel center preaching, you're uh, encouraging and leading people on mission to share the gospel, you're growing groups, but to do all that, you have to have the right leaders in place, both on your in your laity, your average church member, and on your staff. And so uh, churches that are revitalizing are always looking at how can they get their staff um, really to be either more engaged, more productive, and also how you get their lay people, which is the average members of your church, really more involved in owning uh, what's going on. And so uh, today we're going to kind of look at establishing that leadership pipeline. And I'm going to give just a very kind of a general outline of what one could look like. And it'll be up to you, uh, whether you're planting a church, you're part of a church plant, uh, you're helping revitalize or replant a church, or you're at a, a, a pretty healthy church, but you need a little bit better leadership structure. I think this, this will help literally any church at any stage, from a church that's a few months old to a church that's 200 years old, okay? And so I'm really excited to um, give you some great examples at the end of the lecture of two churches who have done this slightly different ways, but still the same concept. So, um, But if you look up, I know Lifeway, um, the uh, Christian um, uh, book retailer, uh, they actually have developed a conference and some training um, called Leadership Pipeline. Uh, I think it's called Leadership Pipeline. But anyways, it's, it's, it's the basic idea of helping walk people through it. So they are now helping 
train pastors and leaders to do that in their church. So there's a lot of really neat things happening. A lot of stuff you can go research now. Some really great books that have come out recently um, that will help you in this. So uh, let's let's uh, go ahead and get into what we're talking about with a, a leadership uh, pipeline. Now we want to develop a, a biblical a biblical foundation for developing leaders. And so uh, this pipeline, as you're going to see, is going to progress a person from here through several stages to here. And uh, so I want to give uh, two examples, one from uh, the ministry of Jesus with his 12 disciples. And this is just from the book of Luke. This is just a simple kind of reading over and looking at some of the key moments in the book. Uh, but you see, like in uh, after Jesus, uh, you know, the first few chapters have his his birth, um, the whole uh, nativity scene, that sort of thing, and his uh, consecration of the temple and all those. And then his calling to ministry um, happen. And then he starts calling his disciples. So in Luke 5 and 6, he starts to call call those first disciples and identify them. And he's begging, telling fishermen, come and you're going to be fishers of men. He tells Matthew, leave your task collector booth and come with me. Follow me. And so he's gathering them. So there's this call to follow. This is the very first beginning. So for us, it's, you know, it's a call to uh, conversion. It's a call to Christian living. It's a call to repentance of faith in Christ. And so uh, Jesus did this with his disciples. Then in Luke 6 through 8, he starts teaching and demonstrating. He gives a lot of uh, different... Um, um, uh, things he starts teaching through to educate the disciples. A lot of they start, you know, wondering what's going on. But he's teaching them about the kingdom of God. He's starting to heal. But he's giving them some some really good biblical lessons. And you'll see in other books, especially like in Matthew and the the Sermon on the Mount. You know, there's a big sermon series almost that Christ gives on this one mountain that really just says, "Here's what Christian living looks like. Here's what it lo- here's what it looks like." to follow me. So he says, follow me. Then he actually teaches what that looks like. When Luke 9, you have this very interesting episode that pretty early on in the ministry, he sends just the 12 that it mentions. It says he sends the 12 locally to proclaim the kingdom and they go and they actually like, you know, get to uh, see some healings and some, uh, you know, the demons are obeying. All those kind of really crazy Holy Spirit led things that Christ has them do as they're pronouncing and announcing the coming, the Christ has come, the kingdom has come. And he sends these 12 out locally in chapter 9 and they come back and report. And, uh, okay, so they have a little bit of follow up the rest of the chapter. Within chapter 10, he sends out the 70. So not only has he sent out the 12, almost like on this Great Commission test run, but uh, he has in Luke 10, he sends the 70 out, which we, we kind of see Jesus, and you probably said this in other classes, um, and I think we even discussed this in our disciple-making class last semester, but you know Jesus kind of had you know different rings of relationships. He had the, the, the three, Peter, James, and John, really close, and he had the 12 disciples, the about 70 that it mentioned, especially here, who were disciples following him, but not part of the 12. They weren't that kind of level of leader. And then these crowds that followed him. So you have these rings of influence that Jesus had that you know followed him at different levels and different times. But in Luke 10, so we had the 70s, a little bit bigger group, almost like the 12, he sends them out in chapter 9 to figure it out, and they come back and they're able to model for a handful, each of them, and maybe even, t- you know, it says they go two by two. So here the disciples are taking some of these others along with them. So now 70 get to go, they go and proclaim the kingdom again, and they come back and they have, it says they have a joyous report. It's actually, um, the, there's wording there compared to chapter 9, it's like it was an even better thing, all right? And there's more follow-up on Christ. There's more conversation about it. Um, in both times, Jesus almost like debriefs with them. How did it go? What did you learn? That sort of thing. So we kind of see that. And then in Luke 11 through 21, the big portion of the book, he gives further teaching, but he answers a lot of questions with parables. So they've kind of they've been learning. They've you know followed Christ. They've been learning. They've gotten these two test runs to experience what mission and proclaiming this kingdom looks like. And then. Jesus brings it back and as, continue, as he's continued to travel around uh, in his ministry with these 12 and the 70 and so forth, um, he's now teaching them even more and in depth and he's answering the questions that they have about what they learned from chapter 9 and 10. And he's answering them with parables, giving them livid, uh, living illustrations to be able to understand. Um, and then in Luke 22 and 23, this interesting episode, them walking with Jesus, we get to the crucifixion, the resurrection, and in 22 and 23, what happens to the disciples? They're gone. I mean, they, they're following Christ. They uh, He taught them about the kingdom. He taught them about the this new kingdom ethic to live by. He sends them out. They're rejoicing. He answers even more questions. And all of a sudden, they betray him. And it's almost like there's a setback. Um, they all leave Jesus, but then in Luke 24, uh, right before his ascension, we actually see that he forgives them, he restores them, he sends them, and he leaves them. And so we see this progression of the 12 disciples because if you read what happens after the book of Luke, the, the four Gospels, the book of Acts happens. And in the book of Acts, they're told they're not just going to be on a commission 
locally, like he told them to, he told them in chapter 19 to kind of stay in a very specific area. Uh, they weren't supposed to go out of uh, um, Israel, Judea at that time. But in the end of 24, so the gospel is going to be proclaimed throughout all the nations. And then, of course, Matthew 28, the Great Commission passage, Acts 1 8, he's going to be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and the other uh, uttermost parts of the earth. And so, in the book of Acts, we see that the disciples have progressed. Now they are leading the global movement of Christianity. We see the disciples and others are spreading out all across the known world. And if you ch study church uh, tradition, you have even um, apostles of the Twelve, like Thomas the Doubter, who went all the way, they, they believe he went um, all the way over into India and China uh, with his ministry, according to some uh, church tradition. And so you see that they, they start out with just a simple call. Hey, let's follow him. They started learning. But you see there was a progression. Jesus didn't say from day one, all right, come and follow me, and tomorrow Pentecost will happen. No, no, there was this three-year training time, and he progressively walked them through. And even when they betrayed him, even when they let him down, he still restores them and brings them back. And I want to put that in because you kind of, you know, as you think through a pipeline, people are going to disappoint you. You might, like, man, this, this, this person is really wired to be one of our small group leaders. Then they have a moral failure, or they just, you know, lose, something happens that really breaks your trust with them. Now, there are some times where it kind of disqualifies them from a pastoral leadership, but I believe very heavily in, in repentance and grace. And I believe that the whole purpose of church discipline, those things are for restoration, to get them back on track for the sake of the body. And so I really think even after we mess up like the disciples, we betray and run from Christ, I think that that doesn't stop a person from being a leader in the church. I think it's uh, we're all sinners and so forth. So anyways, before I start preaching, uh, let's keep on going. So we have Jesus and the 12 disciples. We also have the relationship of Paul and Timothy, which is a very unique one. You have to study... Um, um, actually, across uh, several different books, um, you start with the book of uh, Acts, and you study the First Second Timothy letters he wrote, and the book of Romans. Uh, but I want to read um, uh, this verse. This is one of the personal letters that Paul wrote to Timothy. Um, now we know that when Paul wrote a letter, he typically wrote them to churches. You know, the the Romans, the Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Um, but only a handful of times, Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, he actually writes to an individual. He writes to a person, and uh, this is one of those. So he's writing to his protege that he had mentored and discipled Timothy. And we're going to look at how he progressed Timothy through. 1 Timothy 4, 14 through 15 says, Do not neglect the gift you have, as Paul writing to Timothy, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Okay? And so, um, let's look at how... Timothy progressed, okay? In Acts 16, we have the first uh, mention of Timothy. Paul meets Timothy, and he wants to wants him to join his missionary team, since he was, as uh, Acts 16 says, well spoken of by the brothers and sisters in Lystra, okay? So it's kind of like Jesus called to the disciples, hey, come follow me. Paul sees something in Timothy, he's well spoken of, so you know what, I'm going to take this guy under my wing, and I want to mentor and train him uh, to take my place or to be um, be sent out, whichever it is. So in 1 Timothy, we see this is the first letter written to him, and Paul has, you know, it's not just, hey, come join, Paul calls him my true child in the faith in 1 verse 2. And he says, I, I'm this charge I entrust to you, this responsibility of leading this church, I'm entrusting you with this, verse 18. And so in 1 Timothy, Paul kind of lays out some very simple things and urges Timothy uh, to uh, to teach and model these things, even though he's a young uh, pastor. Chapter 2 talks about prayer. Uh, teaches, you know, here's what we need to see happen in churches regarding prayer. In chapter 3, elder qualifications um, and also deacons. Um, in chapter 4, how to train for godliness. There's this encouragement. Like, it's kind of like the teaching and demonstrating that Jesus did. Uh, be an example, chapter 4. Even though you're young, he gave instructions for the church how the old and the young interact and the women and the men and so forth and how they help each other and how the church body really functions. And then chapter 6, he says, teach doctrine. Be very clear. Don't worry. You know, fight against the, the uh, false prophets coming again. So 1 Timothy has this kind of instruction letter. 2 Timothy changed the tone. There's a lot of instruction, of course, in 2 Timothy. This is the next letter. Things have progressed a little bit more. See, hear what he says in, in chapter 2. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So here, Paul is now starting to embed in Timothy the idea that as you've seen what I've done to you, now it's time for you to do it to another so that they can do it to another. And we talked about this in our disciple-making class. If you want to multiply disciples, not just add, you have to take what you have learned and impart it into others with the understanding that they will impart it into others who will do the same. That's a multiplication idea. And in 2 Timothy 3.10, Paul says, You have followed my teaching. You followed my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love. And he says several of the things. He says, You have already followed me. You've seen my example. I have set the pace for you. 
So follow after me what you have seen me do. Progress even more. You've seen what I have done. Progress even more in your faith by staying very true to the Word of God. There's a lot in both of these books about Timothy just simply staying very, very close to the Word of God, believing that every word is inspired and so forth. Then in Romans 16, 21, we have this very small, not really obscure, but just a kind of a small passing reference. Paul was ending his letter to the Roman church, uh, which would have been a very large influential church in a lot of ways, the center of the known world culturally and um, um, uh, in with government and things. And in Romans 16, Paul is writing to the church of Romans. But he says, Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. It's almost like he's kind of elevated Timothy to kind of the same status. Apparently, Timothy has obeyed uh, 2 Timothy 2 2, and it has in part of that, you know, so no longer is he just the guy who's following Paul. He's the one who's like a fellow worker of Paul. So, in both the, the, the 12 disciples in Christ, we see this progression, and both with Paul and Timothy, we see this progression. So, let's now look at a, a, uh, the phases of a leadership pipeline. This is this is just an example. This is a very skeletal template that you can use um, for any kind of church setting. And take some of these things out, Adam. I just kind of looked at a couple different ones and kind of tried to summarize, just like our church planning phases uh, with establish, prepare, launch, uh, I mean, uh, envision, uh, prepare, launch, establish, repeat. Just kind of generalize these. So this is really just a generalization, some things I've seen in some other churches that I've done and some other ideas. And so don't take this as this is the way you have to do it. But I do want to show that this is a progression just like we saw in the disciples and just like we saw uh, with uh, Paul and Timothy, there is a progression that you want someone to move from being a disciple to being a catalyst. Now, here's something very, very uh, important to, to, to note. Depending on how uh, the, the personality of each individual person in your church, what their spiritual gifting is, what their capacity is. You know, if you have someone who um, is a, uh, a business owner who's working 80 to 90 hours a week, they're probably not going to be able to be one of these uh, further positions just because of time. They're taking care of their family, or they may just simply not want to. But the idea is this is the possibility, this is the spectrum of possibilities. And we don't want people to just stay as disciples. Now, we're always going to be a disciple. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. I'm more talking about of their, of their role. Because a disciple, as we want to say, is a discipler. We want them to be able to progress more than that. We want a person to be able to move from being a disciple to one day being a leader of something to one day maybe being a pastor. So what does that look like? So let's kind of walk through each of these phases and um, get, show, show you some examples of each and also some descriptions that you can uh, tweak and model as you want. Like I said, take this just as a skeleton as an example. So uh, a disciple. So remember we uh, discussed in our disciple making class and for those of you who have not had it, just kind of give a quick overview. We talked about the Great Commission which is, you know, go therefore in all nations, make, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all I've commanded. Love be with you all way, even to the end of the age. Okay, a little bit of King James in there mixed with some ESV, but you get the idea. The Great Commission passage, going, baptizing, teaching, mission, community, formation. Okay, so mission is going, baptizing is community, because it, it, when you're baptized, it brings you into the community. It's identifying, I am with you, I'm letting everyone know through my physical baptism, my immersion in the water and coming back, I'm identifying with Christ and, my, and, and I'm identifying with this community. So mission is about the going, community is about follows the baptizing, and the formation is the teaching to obey. You're being um, uh, spiritually formed by obedience to Christ, not just hearing about what Christ has done, but actually obeying what Christ has said as we see in the text of Scripture. So. A disciple. Let's. I mean, I kind of categorize just for the sake of uh, clarifying and understanding. This is, can be re redone however you uh, see fit. But for mission, a disciple. You think that they are um, in far of their mission, what, how they are going, what it looks like. Well, they they are a discipler. Uh, if we're going to see uh, gospel movements happen, gospel saturation happen in the community, we can't just get someone saved and hope that they become a member and join a Sunday school class or a small group. We have to see them as once you become a believer, you are now a disciple maker. You are to reproduce, okay? That is implicit uh, in the Great Commission, that you will be a, re goes make disciples, plural, okay? So a disciple is automatically a discipler. Even if, you know, they, you're saved on Monday, they should be sharing the gospel that afternoon. And on Tuesday, hopefully they're sharing the gospel and, and sharing, and they're discipling others through their sharing their story and then walking others through scripture as they are. So a person is a discipler, and they're learning about gospel fluency. They're learning to understand the gospel and how to be fluent in speaking the gospel. That's what we mean by gospel fluency. They're able to share the gospel story and are knowing about the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Also in mission, maybe they have joined a Sunday morning team at this point. Maybe they are coming to the 
Sunday morning worship, they're kind of getting involved in the life of the church, maybe they've you know, already been baptized and so forth, and uh, joined membership. Um, but maybe they join some type of Sunday a Sunday morning team to serve. Maybe they help run the coffee table, uh, and they are under the team leader and say, hey, one time, uh, you know, once every four weeks you're in charge of the coffee bar, or once every four weeks you uh, serve in our uh, nursery, or something like that. So they join, they just join and are a member of a Sunday morning team. Get them involved in some local mission for the sake of the church. But you also want them to be an outside mission, not just in the, the worship time on Sunday morning, but you want them to maybe part of their Sunday school class or a small group to be joining in some type of mission endeavor outside, but they're just doing it along with. They're not really coordinating. They're just joining and be part. Maybe we're progressing somebody. As far as community, we want their family to grow and be involved in the life of church. We want that person to be uh, discipled in a discipleship group. Maybe it's a one-on-one or one-on-two or some other type of small group where they are intentionally being discipled by somebody. And also a member of a small group, whatever that looks like for your church, a home group, or if, if you have a house church, um, and it's essentially just part of that house church, or if uh, you have Sunday school or some other type of uh, Bible fellowship type equipping classes, then have them be a member of that. You know, you're getting them started. Let them see what it means to be a member and join these things. And their spiritual formation, how they're learning to obey. Corporately, they're participating in worship. They're coming and they're hearing preaching. They're joining in worship. Um, and so that's kind of their uh, corporate type formation. But also, they're learning the spiritual disciplines through their discipleship group and the small group they're part of. They're learning what it means to obey uh, Jesus Christ, and they're understanding spiritual disciplines such as Bible study and prayer um, and tithing and uh, serving and those type of things. And they're also learning about their spiritual gifts. Uh, when a person is newly saved, they probably have no idea that they've been given this crazy thing called a spiritual gift, and there's a way that we can kind of help them figure it out and help them use it. So they're learning about these. Now let's uh, progress to the next one, an apprentice. Now, you're starting to read this week uh, the book um, Exponential, uh, which uh, Exponential is um, uh, one of my really favorite small books about church planning because the the subtitle there is How You and Your Friends Can Start a Gospel Movement, which just excites me and made me read the book uh, several years ago when it first came out. And uh, I've enjoyed using this class because I think that one of the biggest lessons I have learned, uh, and they do they do very big church. They, they're a, a multi-campus church of several thousand. They've planted churches that have several thousand. And I'm not particularly wired, I don't think, to necessarily do that, but there's so much in what they say uh, that is gold. It's really they have really good systems. That's why I want you to read the book. But one thing that really stuck out to me throughout the whole book is the idea of apprenticing everything. Okay, so if you if if the person joins the coffee team, okay, like we mentioned as a disciple, they join the coffee team. We well, you know what? Let's start training them to become a coffee team leader. But let's give them three months of apprenticing in that role. Um, before they start leading. And one of the rules of the, the uh, Community Christian Church with the authors of Exponential, what they do, one of their rules, which I love and we're, imp- we're going to implement it in the church that we're planting, is that you apprentice, everybody finds an apprentice. You apprentice everything. So if you are uh, leading some part of the worship team, you're going to apprentice and find your replacement or you're finding others to join that team in some way. Um, even it all, go all, goes all the way up to the pastor. Pastors, are you actually looking for an apprentice who will one day take your spot as pastor or be sent out to plant another church and pastor somewhere else. All right. So apprentice everything. And I would say this is key for churches with Sunday schools who would like to maybe multiply into more Sunday schools instead of having an assistant teacher whose only role is to cover when the main teacher is out of town. Have it have instead of being an assistant Sunday school teacher, have them be an apprentice to the Sunday school teacher where it is understood after six months of direct involvement from the leader and given responsibility, given feedback and all sorts of things, after six months they will take over or start a new class. So you, you start you're building in a culture of multiplication just by apprenticing everything. Okay, so you still that to your small group leaders. Hey, small group leader, you got ten people meeting in your home. Who in there, early on, are you starting to identify that, you know, they've got some leadership potential. I'm going to start getting with them a little bit more personal. I'm going to start um, asking them to lead in the Bible story, uh, Bible study time once a month. I'm going to ask them to be uh, leading. the. I'm going to ask them to do certain things. So I did this uh, at uh, my church in Winston at 121. I was our small. Our, we had home groups called Gospel Communities, and um, I was an apprentice under one for about four or five months, and then we started um, one with there were four of us, and we grew up to about about a dozen, dozen 13, 14, and um, in about a year time. And so at, during that time, as we were growing it, 
After about four, five, six months, there was a guy named Matt who I really thought would be a good leader. And at that point, we didn't know that we would be leaving the church to move to another city for church planning. That was before that started. But I was already thinking because I'd read Exponential and started thinking this way, I bet Matt could either lead this group that we've started one day and I could start another one. Or maybe we send him out with two or three to start a new group and help that one to grow. So it was a multiplication. So we were identified him. So I started giving him uh, some responsibility. I said, hey, Matt, can you lead and teach next week? Okay, yeah, sure. Here's what we're doing. Give him everything that he needed. And then we you know, we, we would kind of debrief, get some feedback, and talk it out a little bit. And uh, and then we'd also identify some others in the group and start giving them some responsibility. Maybe plant the seed for them to become a future apprentice. Um, uh, but I wanted to just really focus on Matt, especially when we knew we were moving. I knew I only had about four months until we were uh, going to be gone, uh, moved to another country. And so I, I specifically started investing him a whole lot more to make sure he was ready. And to this day, a year later, he's still that group leader. Okay? And I just encouraged him, hey, find your next apprentice and uh, go ahead and train that person. Start identifying them. So anyway, an apprentice, though, their role as far as mission, they're starting to lead others in making disciples. They're not just um, they're a discipler, but they're helping other disciples to figure it out and do the same thing. So they're kind of giving a little bit more leadership. Um, there's an intentional training and preparation on a Sunday morning team. So instead of just joining a team, the leader of that team is saying, hey, I want you to start operating the soundboard uh, you know, once a month, I'm going to be with you, and then I'm going to let you kind of do it by yourself and test it out, and then one day you can take my spot. So that's kind of the idea, intentional training preparation uh, for some type of Sunday morning uh, worship team, uh, worship service team. You're also assisting with the mission initiative. You're not just doing things along with the small group. You're actually assisting with it. Hey, um, uh, Matt, why don't you take over our volunteering where we go to uh, the local food pantry every Thursday evening and help uh, pass out uh, meals or whatever it is. How about you oversee that? I've been doing it, but how about you oversee that? Give them some responsibility. Give them some feedback. And let them learn through experience and things and then do some feedback with them. So not only are they just not doing it along, they actually may be um, assisting in that or even leading it a little bit. As far as community, what's like to be part of the body and that kind of growth, there are, their family has been involved as an apprentice. You know, your family should start to become a, a model for other families. Um, you're not just a part of a D group. Now you're leading a discipleship group. And there's further intentional training for leading a small group or becoming the next Sunday school teacher or so forth. There's intentional training done by the leader. Formation corporately, maybe they're taking some new training classes in the church. Maybe church is able to offer some uh, leadership classes or the team leader of a different department or ministry team or something has some training that they do with this apprentice in order to give them some more information. Like we saw with the 12 disciples, uh, Jesus was apprenticing those 12 disciples to get them ready. Um, and then also there's an accountability for spiritual disciplines. You've learned about them as a disciple. Now let's start holding you accountable. Let's really start um, helping you understanding those you know, deeper. And that way you as an apprentice can go and help others. Uh, and then formation, you're also mentored to use spiritual gifts, not just learning them, you're mentored on how to use them. Okay, and it's all part of that apprenticeship time. Um, and you know, a lot of this, if someone is uh, you know, someone who has been a believer for 20, 30, 40 years, you know, they may some of these parts may not really apply. And they may have been a part of a small group or whatever, but the apprenticeship, the key focus here is that is an intentional training time. And if we identify someone as an apprentice and not just an assistant, you're telling them you're going to become a leader. You're not just going to be the assistant for 20 years. You will become the director or leader over something, either in my place or in some other um, area or some other location. So I think it really just that um, uh, imagery helps people think, I'm, okay, I'm not just a fill-in. I'm not just a substitute. I'm not just going to be there when you're gone. I'm actually, this is a very intentional step to get me to the next one, which we will say is a leader. Uh, now, uh, we're going to give some examples of leaders here after this, but a leader, as far as mission, they're responsible for training others, training those apprentices, training other people in making disciples of gospel fluency. Uh, they're helping lead a Sunday morning team. They're not just a member of one. They're not learning how to one. They're actually leading. They are the uh, audiovisual team leader. They are the coffee bar team leader, and they're in charge of other people, and they're ensuring that everything is going well. Uh, they're, overseeing, they're overseeing a mission initiative, not just assisting with one. They're now overseeing one for their small group or for uh, maybe for the church as a whole. Um, for as for a community and building community, they're helping multiply discipleship groups, not just lead one. They are fully leading their own small group. Um, I was uh, this was my role at our church. Uh, I became I was a disciple when I you know, first uh, joined. I was an apprentice, and then I became a small group leader. And uh, the pastors. Um, 
actually were talking to me a little bit about maybe one day becoming uh, another like a lay pastor at our church, but then the church plan in Calgary worked out, so we kind of stopped that. But they were walking me through their own pipeline, and I was at the face of being a group leader, um, and so I was uh, fully responsible for leading a small group in my home. This could be a Sunday school teacher as well. Um, but another key thing as far as in the being in the community of the church that a leader must do is identify and raise up apprentices. Remember, we said apprentice everything. Every role has an apprentice. So when you become a leader or something, even if you're like, I am the parking team leader, like, what? how is that important? Well, that's very important because you don't want any kind of confusion and kids getting run over, right? And so raise up an apprentice who's going to take your place or learn how to do it in case you move on, in case you um, join another church plant or move your membership, whatever it is. You know, someone needs to be able to take your spot. So no matter what the position, the leader should always be identifying an apprentice or maybe even two apprentices, depending on the need of the church. As far as spiritual formation and the teaching to obey corporately, they're now teaching classes at church. They're teaching those apprentices and others what it means to be part of this team. Or maybe they're teaching some training classes or some type of uh, apologetics or evangelism. You know, they're leading those things. Maybe you have a, a, an evangelism team leader. Now they're identified apprentices to help multiply teams who are going out, whatever evangelism method you're using. But they're teaching those classes, not just participating and taking new ones. They're able to teach those now. Now, up to this time, we've really talked more about um, lay people. And I really think here this um, at, at the leader role is really starting to see that maybe some can become staff or something else. So we're kind of getting into where we can still talk about lay leaders here, but we also can talk about staff leaders here, okay? Um, uh, corporately, they're teaching classes, biblical qualifications, maybe looking at, uh, may, are they qualified to be a deacon? Um, I would uh, put deacons under this category as far as leadership in the church. They're leading a benevolency ministry or a service ministry. I think that's maybe the role of deacons, uh, not just be a board who votes, so to speak. I know it's a lot of our Baptist ways, and um, I don't think that is exactly what uh, uh, is mentioned in the Bible uh, from our example in Acts 6, Acts 6 and the qualification. I think deacons are really um, making sure that the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, members of the church are taken care of through helps type ministries and overseeing that uh, while also leading on evangelistic mission uh, so the pastors can focus on preaching um, and counseling and some of those other things. So anyways, this is not a class about deacons. Uh, you can email me later uh, if you want to know more about what I think about the role of deacon, but I highly value that role. I just think we need to do a little bit better with it um, and really utilize the talents our church has and not just put them on a voting board. Um, but anyways, off my soapbox, now they're also helping others realize their spiritual gifts. They've learned their gifts. They've been mentored in them. Mentored in them now as a leader, they are helping others use and understand their spiritual gifts. So here are a few examples of uh, that leader role. Uh, like I said, this can, this can kind of change depending on how you lay out your leadership ladder. These are just some examples that I see them as. It doesn't have to be, uh, this is not the Bible for sure. Some examples, uh, a small group leader, Sunday school teacher, a first impressions team leader, like the parking, greeting, coffee bar, and some of those other things. Make sure that if you have like a guest center where people will new, new guests bring their connection card and get a gift and that sort of thing, uh, they may someone you want coordinating and leading that. Um, a worship or audiovisual team leader. Uh, some churches aren't able to pay a worship leader or worship pastor. So a lot of times the leader, um, or, or they may be paid, but they're not a pastoral position. Um, that's why we say sometimes a worship leader versus a worship pastor. A lot of it depends on how the church wants to, to word it and really see it. Uh, but maybe you're overseeing some aspect of worship. Maybe you have a drama team or something else like that, and you're having a team leader over this. Maybe it's a youth choir or something like that. Uh, a children or youth uh, team leader. Um, now, uh, you could have, uh, like, a, uh, my first youth ministry position, I was not considered the youth pastor. I was uh, the youth director. Um, I was not an ordained reverend at the time. I was very young, fresh out of undergrad, and rightfully so, the church said, we're not, not quite ready to call you a pastor because we haven't seen you minister for years. Um, and so uh, I started out as more of a director. So I would have been in this role where I was overseeing a team and overseeing a ministry, uh, but I was really the team leader, and I happened to be in a, it's a paid position for me. Uh, just like we have support staff in the church office, an outreach coordinator of some sort. Um, and I would say a lot of times the leader may be some type of su support staff um, or even like a team leader or a director, director of kids ministry. Maybe um, that is uh, someone in your church that is on the payroll. They are being paid to have an office at the church, but they're not necessarily a pastor, so to speak. Um, and I would put deacons um, here as well. I wouldn't limit deacons to just this. I think deacons can progress and often see them do that very, very uh, well. But I would say at this is the point where we start to see, uh, even in the apprentice phase, 
how about your deacons apprentice uh, another deacon before a church just writes a bunch of names and votes? What if you said, let's identify some men, have them start apprenticing as deacons with our current deacons, and then once we have five who go through that apprenticeship, you know what, the two who just really did well and really um, uh, surpassed our expectations, or you know, maybe those two should be the ones nominated to be voted on by the church, so to speak. So anyways, there's some ways to, to kind of see this and incorporate it into all the positions of your church. Uh, the next we're having is, is the coach and this is a um, one that's probably probably not thought of in in most established churches is having a coach now the, the coach is a little bit different from a leader because the coach is someone who has has some experience in leading but is now able to train trainers okay so this takes the um uh, the, the next level from a leader to now you're a leader of leaders. That's all a coach is, okay? So as far as mission, you're training trainers for making disciples, okay? You're writing the curriculum for your church that the leaders are taking to their teams or the small group leaders are using in their groups in order to train for disciple making, okay? So they're really overseeing a whole lot. And this could be a paid staff position or this may be um, um, a, a lay person, okay? It depends on the size of your church and what your church needs. They're also overseeing Sunday morning team leaders, um, we mentioned first impressions as just a ministry. Now, first impressions, depending on your church, often involves things like parking, door greeting, coffee, guest center. Uh, you know, those type of things usually come into first impressions. Are we making make sure who who is there to make sure everything runs smoothly before people walk into the doors of the sanctuary? That's really first impressions. Now. Someone who is overseeing the Sunday morning team leaders is maybe the first impressions director, but they're overseeing the, the leader of the parking, the leader of the greeting, the leader of the coffee bar, and so forth. So they're kind of overseeing those leaders. Also, they're assisting other group leaders to start a mission initiative for a small group. So no longer are they the ones who, in their own uh, uh, individual small group, are overseeing and doing things. Maybe they're helping two or three other small group leaders or the ones who are kind of overseeing the, the mission or evangelism component of their small group or Sunday school class, maybe they are now working with multiple um, small group leaders to help them um, uh, develop a new mission for their group or something along those lines. As far as community, uh, what does it mean to be part of that body, building that community? Well, they are also multiplying D group leaders, not just multiplying discipleship groups. They're multiplying discipleship, discipleship group leaders. So here, here's where this kind of can get really fun. If you have an, a lay person, a businessman or woman who has just done really well at having these one-on-one -on -one relationships with people where they work, um, or where they have lunch with others, and they have been able to grow and actually uh, multiply other little discipleship groups to where every day at lunch, uh, Bob uh, is um, meeting with someone different, discipling them in some way, or uh, Susan is doing the same thing at her office. She's a lawyer, and she is taking her lunch breaks, so maybe it's breakfast before work, and she's meeting with another lady or two, and she's she's able, also she's led these and helped multiply them. Well, what if now she is multiplying these group leaders? So now on Monday, She's not just leading her, um, you know, she's not leading a discipleship group with new believers, so to speak, with one or two other new believers. She's actually meeting with one or two leaders, helping them understand how she has multiplied uh, more groups. And so she is now multiplying her effort by giving that one day towards that. So this is not just for paid people. It's also for laity as well. And once you give them that role, say, hey, we really see, Susan, that you've done so well and have these uh, uh, discipleship groups. You've started so many and it's grown your small group and different things. And we're, I mean, uh, great idea. Will you help these two other ladies figure out how to do that too? And then walk with them for three months and then these other two ladies want to give you as well. So she becomes a coach, but she doesn't have an official title or anything like that for the church. She's just a coach for discipleship group leaders. That's just an example. Um, it's also in community, the coaching, mentoring several small group leaders. Um, uh, and this could be a pastoral position as well. Uh, many churches, like uh, my uh, previous church, 121, that I just mentioned. Uh, so I led a gospel community, and one of the elders of the church actually has the coach. So that's why it's not always you know as cut and dry. Sometimes the coach is also a pastor. Uh, but he was a um, he was not a full time pastor of the church, and he really his job was pastor of gospel communities. So he was our coach, and he was also in that pastor role. So that's kind of how they blend and match a little bit. Um, that's how our church did it. Your church 
may have a pastor who oversees the Sunday school teachers or something else, or it could be a layperson who does it, who is not a pastor, they're not a deacon, but they just really know how to coach and oversee other small group leaders. Now, my personal preference would probably be to have something like that to be a pastoral type role, because I think it's that important to have a pastor over your small groups or a pastor who's leading the small group leaders, but I'm just saying it doesn't necessarily have to be. It just fulfills the position of a coach that they may have the role of a pastor, so maybe that clarifies a little bit. Um, and they're also assessing. Um, they're now coaching, coaching small group leaders, Sunday school teachers, mentoring them. But they're also starting to assess. Okay, this leader has identified a new apprentice. Let's help maybe give them some assessment to see, uh, give them some questions and some time to see are they you know, biblically qualified? Do they have an understanding? Uh, are they wired for this? So they're starting to ex assess potential leaders um, who are going to be leading these teams and groups. And they're just helping in that process as a good discerning voice. Especially if you have a a pipeline that is trying to help multiply church planters and you have a church planting apprentice uh, who like me, myself I was a church planting apprentice who became a small group leader as an apprentice but I went through an assessment through the pastors and the gospel community coaches went through an assessment to see if I was really capable um, to do that and so the assessing by the coach or pastor is a really good thing, uh, healthy for the church. Formation, corporately developing classes at the church and not just teaching them, but now developing new classes. They're writing the curriculum for it uh, because they have helped oversee others. They have that experience. Uh, they have a mutual accountability for spiritual disciplines. That never stops no matter what phase you're in. There always should be mutual accountability. Someone is asking that coach, hey, we know you're doing some great things for the church, either you're paid or you're a lay person, but how are you doing in your, in your prayer life? Are you studying scripture? Are you tithing? Those type of things. So there's always a mutual accountability. Don't ever forget that. Um, and then also developing systems for utilizing spiritual gifts, not just teaching someone else. Maybe they're developing some tools that the church, that their own church is using, that their small group leaders has. He's overseeing, he or she is overseeing these small group leaders. Then they're developing systems to help identify, okay, what are your spiritual gifts? How are you utilizing them? So the coaches really, because of their experience, they're able to do that. Now, uh, because I just kind of mentioned he or she in this, uh, this is going to be kind of to you, uh, which of these you, uh, depending on um, you know how you view you know women in ministry and that sort of thing for uh, roles of deacon and elder um, here at Piedmont at our school, uh, you know we are very clear that we believe the uh, pastoring is for uh, males and that uh, we would also say uh, deacon uh, leadership is for males or maybe for couples, maybe a husband and wife served together. Um, I'll be one to venture out and say uh, for the pastoral role, yes, I believe it should be for males. Um, I believe that is a biblical pattern. Uh, for deacons, though, uh, the Bible does have a deaconess mentioned. Um, I'm going to go with that. I'm just going to kind of leave it at that and let you kind of wonder and ponder a little bit. Don't ask Hollinger um, what I believe because I haven't even told him yet. So anyways, um, but I'm a little bit more um, free in having uh, female deacons than some other in our uh, tribe are. And just don't tweet that. I like to keep my job. Anyways, you're laughing now. I know some of you are laughing a lot who know me better and have heard me say more than that. But anyways, it's not enough to get me fired from Piedmont. It's not what this is about. I just believe that there are some roles you need to, as a church, decide depending on, you know, if it's a coach of ladies discipleship groups, of course you can be a lady. If it's a coach who is um, more of a pastoral type position, then that's when you start need to really assessing those things. So just throwing that out so you can uh, think through that, what fits your church and uh, your understanding uh, for these roles as well. Um, here's some examples of a coach, small group leader, trainer, Sunday school director, uh, to a church I grew up in, uh, my father-in-law was actually a Sunday school director. So he was in charge of the other Sunday school teachers, uh, just made sure they had all their curriculum. He did some training with them because he had many years of teaching experience. So he was like a Sunday school director, and I would see that as a coach role. Uh, a first impressions director, we've already mentioned, worship Teams director, if your church does not call that a pastor, but they're a director, they're overseeing leaders of other kind of music ministries or worship ministries. Church planting director, sometimes this could be a pastor because often your church planting director was one who has planted a church and has that kind of experience. Um, but maybe they're not really necessarily a pastor of the church, they're just paid by the church um, to help oversee their church planting program. Uh, many churches like the Summit Church, for instance, have a church planning director who I don't believe, uh, to my knowledge, is a pastor of the church. I think the, the, the main one is, but the associate director isn't. Um, it's my understanding. Anyways, uh, this is more of a coach because you're overseeing others uh, who are leaders. 
Um, and I, and a staff department director, maybe like, a, and I'll put a discipleship pastor or maybe a discipleship director could be this if they're overseeing the youth pastor, the children's pastor, the single adults pastor, you know, being on the size of your church, of course. Um, some of this is uh, you're just trying to say, hey, I'm just trying to find an apprentice. Uh, understand that I'm planning a church. Right now we have three members. Well, four, one's a dog. So anyways, um, and uh, deacons, I would say, uh, especially like that chairman position, um, I think uh, having them seen as a coach for other deacons is a really good, um, healthy model. So, I, you know, leaders or deacons can be deacons, I think coaches as well. Um, well let's get through this. Uh, next is pastor. Okay, so we kind of stepped um, to this uh, next level, and depending on your view, so, you know, uh, some churches have a senior pastor um, and a deacon board or a leadership team or something else. Others have a plurality of pastors or elders. So that's completely up to you. I think both you can defend exegetically. I think both really depend on context and how uh, what your church really prefers. Um, and so, anyways, uh, I think it's kind of open. If we have pastor or pastors, the, the idea here is. Are you, as a pastor, maybe you're um, at a church that has uh, just one pastor, the the senior pastor, um, and then there's maybe a deacon board and Sunday school teachers and so forth, but have you actually identified a young man in your church pastor who you should be apprenticing to maybe become a Sunday school teacher, to become a Sunday school director, and give him some more experience and maybe become a pastor one day? Okay, are you looking in your membership when you preach on Sunday morning? You stand behind that pulpit. Are you looking out and you're saying, you know what, that should, that that guy right there needs to be a pastor in about three years. Let's let's start getting him. Maybe he needs to do some seminary training, or maybe he needs to do do something else. So, are you identifying um, uh, future pastors, maybe to take your place or to send out as planters or to go to pastor the churches? So. Um, so his mission, pastor, he's leading the church in multiplying disciples. He's really just casting that vision for here's how we're following the Great Commission, leading the church as a whole, leading the coaches and the leaders, overseeing all those areas. Uh, the pastor is also celebrating Sunday morning teams. Um, pastor is not a good idea, pastor, um, especially when you have enough people. Now, uh, for, for me as a church planter, um, I'm going to be on the setup team because we're going to be a mobile church. I'm probably going to be on the coffee team, so I'll be in charge of brewing it. But I'm going to be finding people to take those roles quickly because really, Pastor, you need to be focusing on uh, leading that Sunday morning worship time and preaching God's word faithfully. And so the better you can do that, because you not because you're lazy, because you're not willing to do the job. It's because you really it serves the whole church better when you can have other people leading things that they can do. Yes, Pastor, you can do 20 things on a Sunday morning, but you really just need to do one. So anyways, celebrate the Sunday morning teams. Don't be a part of the setup team um, um, when you have enough people to do it. But um, do you get in there? Like for me, will I always be on the teardown team? Of course. I'm done preaching. I've done connecting with people. I've handled you know, in-house issues. I've met, you know, done all those things. Yes, I want to help stack chairs. Yes, I want to help clean the bathrooms when we're done because that's how I'm wired. Uh, I think a pastor should be a, a servant leader before anything else. What I'm saying is don't do so much that you are taking away the opportunity for other people to be involved in leadership. That's what I'm trying to convey. Not just go be lazy and think, oh, I'm the pastor, I don't have to do all that. No, 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 no. Especially if you're a planter, and this is a class on church plan, you're going to be doing almost every role for the first you know, several months, maybe in the first year or two. Okay, but so identify people who take over those things. Okay, and then you can find that you can really focus. It's Act six, let the deacons handle serving uh, the people, passing out the food. You handle preaching the word of God. Okay, um, but also be willing to do so those other things. So I think I've, I think I've mostly clarified that. Um, and then casting a missional vision for small groups. Um, I think a pastor should always be a member of a small group. Sometimes they should be a leader of the small group. Sometimes they shouldn't be. Okay, it's up to what the pastor wants to do. The pastor wants to keep leading their um, small group, or their, they they want to teach a central class. Let them. If the pastor wants to go for that. Okay, um, but overall, in the big picture, as a pastor, and even this is a, if this is a team of pastors, a plurality of elders, you still should be casting a missional vision for what small groups, whether Sunday school classes, home groups, whatever it is, you're casting a vision for what they should be doing. You're doing it through your preaching, through your teaching, through your equipping, all these type of things. But you're overseeing, you're casting this big picture, big picture vision. As far as community, you're multiplying coaches and leaders in discipleship groups. I think a pastor should always have someone who they're apprenticing, have someone that they're mentoring. Um, I think, I, I, think uh, I hope I get this statement right, that uh, every pastor should um, have both a Timothy and a Paul. And the idea is every pastor should have someone who they're pouring into, all right, 
whether it's a coach or maybe it's a leader or even an apprentice or a new disciple. Uh, don't just think, well, I'm the pastor. I can only deal with the coaches. No, you, you should be sharing the gospel when you're studying for your sermon at Starbucks, leading people to Christ too. You should be leading your neighbors to Christ. You should never stop evangelizing. Man, don't ever take any of my classes and think that you don't do that. Um, so you're laughing again. Um, it's late at night. I'm recording this. Um, but let me get back. The pastor, he's helping multiply coaches and leaders because every pastor should have a Timothy, someone that they're pouring into, maybe multiple people they're pouring into. They should also have a Paul, someone who's pouring into them. Okay, and uh, so I think that's a they're very wise thing that uh, Pastor uh, years ago uh, mentioned to me. So um, who who is pouring into me and who am I pouring into? So I think that is very essential. Um, also, in the community side of church life, you're overseeing mentoring small group coaches. And so you're bringing, uh, if your church has, maybe they have uh, 20 small groups and you've got uh, four coaches who are kind of overseeing five groups of their own type of thing just to encourage while they're also leading their own. How about you oversee and mentor those? Get those small group coaches in or leaders. Get them together on a regular basis just to see how they're doing. Check up with them through email and phone and text and that sort of thing. See how you can better serve and pray for their groups, how, you, how your group can be a better example. So oversee and mentor those small group coaches. Um, also, equipping the leaders of teams and groups. Uh, the, the Ephesians 4.12 says our job as pastoral leaders is to equip the body, equip the people for the work of the ministry, equip the saints uh, for doing the work of the ministry. And so there's a there's a time where the pastor is really equipping those leaders of teams. And after they have equipped those leaders um, or those coaches, then they go and help um, all the teams do it. So I'm, I will not be the best uh, one to um, uh, be on the worship team, I have no musical talent whatsoever, whether singing or playing. I struggle with iTunes, okay? And so I would not be good at that. But I want to check up with the worship leader, the worship director. I want to make sure that they're good. I want to make sure that you know they are healthy. I want to make sure that they are doing okay spiritually, that they're practicing the discipline, that they're feeling loved and that's worth it. I want to keep up with them. But I want to equip them spiritually so they can do their job, all right? So they can do what they're really good at, even though I can't do it. All right, so I'm just equipping those leaders. As far as spiritual uh, spiritual formation, um, corporately, um, you know, as a pastor, you progress. You're not just sitting in the church. You're not just uh, there. You are um, faithfully preaching Christ. Okay, you're doing Christ-centered preaching. No, notice my Canadian spelling. That is uh, not a misspelling. Uh, we do spell centered that way uh, in my new area, so I'm trying to learn that. Um, so anyways, corporately, now you're the one who um, is uh, imparting the spiritual formation while you're also being formed yourself. Um, also, as far as formation, pastor needs to meet the biblical qualifications for elders that we see in uh, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus uh, 1. And also de developing discipleship pathways. I think this is so key. I think um, the pastor really is in charge of developing that discipleship pathway and this leadership pipeline, developing those tools to help the coaches and the directors and the leaders and so forth, disseminate that, to, that down to the people. But when you're the one who God has called and, and put in place to lead this church, you, you, need to be, you need to be the one who is overseeing developing these pathways, not by yourself. You need to develop them alongside your coaches and your small group leaders. Develop your leadership pipeline with your Sunday school teachers. But you are the one pastor who is overseeing this. So if you are an aspiring church planter, okay, you know that it's going to be one, two, four, ten years before you plant. Go ahead and start thinking, how can you start developing and thinking through the discipleship pathway? Then once you get to your context, once you get to that location where God will call you to plant one day, you've already got a frame for understanding. Then you figure out, you work with your people, and you develop a clear pathway that helps people walk through that. So here's some examples of pastor, lay elders. I think lay pastors, they've gone through and they're not paid by the church. Um, but uh, they do meet all the qualifications. They've led groups, they've led teams, all that sort of thing. Uh, lead pastor, whether it's paid or bivocational, even completely unpaid. Um, missions pastor, um, like I said, this could be a director, coach position. It could be a leader position, depending on what your church has and what it's capable of doing. But a lot of churches see uh, like a missions or a discipleship or worship as a pastoral role. They are joining with the pastor and doing these things of leading the church, of casting these visions, of overseeing the coaches and things. All right, And they're helping develop these systems. So uh, it really just depends on how your church wants to do this and who um, God has your church. Let's uh, briefly go through Catalyst. Catalyst is one where um, this is kind of a new one maybe for you. It's a new one for me as well. Well, because growing up where, where I did, no one became anything more than a pastor, usually. A handful of people would become like the, the local associational mission director or you know maybe get hired by um, the Southern Baptist Convention or some other denomination to do something, but that was very rare. But what if you had in-house catalyst in your own church? 
who um, were, were pastor at some point, maybe were pastors, they've kind of moved on. I was meeting with a, a pastor here in Calgary, uh, one I actually met at the park, he met he and his family at the park. He pastors a, a church um, um, probably about 10, 10 miles from uh, from where we live. But I was just, you know, I had coffee with him yesterday and just kind of chatting a little bit. And he was telling me how um, uh, at their church, the, the founding pastor who planted the church, um, was pastor for years. He passed on the baton to his his own son, who uh, was an associate pastor. And so then now the the son is the senior pastor. And the dad who founded the church, he was a planter of it and a pastor for I think thirty years. A long, very strong legacy. They they have one hundred and nineteen uh, church plants all over the world. All right, this is one church up in Red Deer. Um, uh, Alberta, Canada, which is uh, Red Deer, is about an hour and a half from Calgary, where I am, and they have uh, two churches in Calgary that they have planted. So they have 119. They're really well connected. They almost call them campuses, but they each have their own pastor. So it's a little bit interesting kind of uh, mix. But he wanted to focus more on being a catalyst. So his job, he's still paid by the church. This this founding uh, planter pastor, he's still paid by the church, but his job is to travel around the world and help equip the pastors in these 119 locations to plant more out of their own churches while also going to places where they would like to get a new one started and taking apprentice church planning apprentices with him to go and do that. So he is still paid by the church, but he's a catalyst for something more. He's not doing the day-to-day -day preaching. He's not overseeing a lot of the counseling. He's doing something that is more of this uh, kingdom ex um, expansion type thing. So this is a really exciting one, I think. Um, my own uh, pastor, Will Plitt, who has been featured in this class before, he was my pastor at 121, but he was also a catalyst for the Christ Together Network. And so he stepped away from being a pastor, a paid full-time paid pastor, and became the executive director of Christ Together. So he's still a member of a local church in Winston-Salem, still actively part of a, a small group and all those sort of things. But his job now um, as part of the church is this church playing network director. So anyways, a catalyst kind of moves on past a pastor. There's, sometimes there's still a pastor. That, that's, that's, that's still a little fuzzy. It's not a clear-cut line. Um, they're leading a city and multiplying disciples. They're now not just leading a church. They're, they're kind of casting a bigger city-wide vision. Uh, they're recruiting other pastors for gospel saturation. They are a pastor for other pastors outside their own church. They're, they're developing systems for planning churches. They're getting uh, church networks across um, one city or one state kind of organized organized and they're kind of overseeing that. Um, as far as community, they're networking with other Christian leaders to see how can we go after every man, woman, child together. They're gathering these leaders for collaboration. They're equipping pastors both inside their own church and outside their church. Uh, as far as formation, they're often teaching at other churches. They may not be preaching every Sunday, mo uh, Sunday morning at, at their, their one church anymore because maybe their role is no longer the teaching pastor, so to speak, uh, but they're maybe teaching or training at other churches. Okay, They're going beyond uh, their four walls, so to speak. Uh, they're mentoring pastors and spiritual disciplines, uh, not just uh, leaders and coaches and so forth um, but, uh, from other churches, but they're still a faithful member um, or even a pastor of a church. They still have a lo local church connection. I think that's so essential. Don't become a denominational leader or a catalyst one day and forget the local church. Do that to help the local church as a role or a job inside the local church. Now, here's some of the examples. A church's collaboration pastor. Uh, so this is this is a new one. There is a church in Raleigh uh, called Hope Church. That's part of the Christ Together Network that I'm familiar with. And Hope Church in Raleigh actually kind of started their own the the Raleigh Durham. North Carolina uh, chapter or gathering of pastors. They got about 20 or 30 or so pastors getting together in that in that city to go after every man, woman, and child, to go after collaboration together. We've talked about that before. But Hope Church had a pastor who, this is a large church, several thousand members, uh, I think eight to 10,000, somewhere in that range. I think they have three or four campuses across the Raleigh-Durham area. Anyway, very large church, very influential church. One of their pastors was uh, in charge of leadership development. He was like their pastor for developing new leaders, and um, he was an executive pastor for a while. So he had a lot of really kind of high-level roles in this large church, so to speak. They now pay him his same salary that he was getting, but his job is to not do anything for Hope Church. His job is to collaborate and work with other pastors in the area. His job is to help train them, to equip them, to love them and work with them. He has a paycheck from Hope, Hope Church, and he has an office at Hope Church. And he uses the facilities to bring these pastors together for uh, monthly meetings and lunches and that sort of thing. But his job is to 
uh, uh, help his city. He's actually a pastor for the city more than he is for his own church, but is serving his own church because as he's helping the city, he's helping his church. So that's a really cool position that I would love for your church, even mine, to get to the point where that could be a paid position at our church and we have a collaboration pastor. Uh, so just plant some seeds. If one of you guys pl uh, plants and starts a, a, a mega church, do this. All right, love your city more. Um, be a church for your, be a pastor for your city, not just for your own church. Um, church planning network director. This is another example of a catalyst type role, uh, or maybe they are part of a uh, denominational leader. Um, like the, for instance, I'm with the North American Mission Board, and we have in each of the cities they focus on, like for Calgary, they have a church planning catalyst who is a member of a local church, but his his paycheck comes from our mission board, and his job is to recruit and train other planters. Okay, that's his job. So he's a catalyst for getting things going uh, for and through local churches, and he works with local churches to identify people in inside and also outside. Um, and I would even say that seminary professors in administration are really in, in a catalytic type role because they are serving many churches um, as they are preparing you uh, for your So I guess in a way, I'm kind of a catalyst in that part. But as far as a local church is concerned, I'm not a catalyst yet. Uh, I am still at the very beginning phases. So, boy, I'm almost out of breath. Let me give you some examples. This is the church at Cane Bay. They're in Goose Creek, South Carolina, which I think is um, kind of close to Myrtle Beach, I think. I'm not exactly sure, but the church at Cane Bay uh, in Goose Creek, South Carolina. This is what they call their leadership path. And there's their uh, church website if you do want to go and visit and um, check them out. Um, so here is an example of how uh, of what they have called their leadership path. This is their pathway. Uh, so they start with a disciple, and they have a huddle leader. A huddle leader is kind of like a the group. They're responsible, as you see, there's roles responsible for one or two others in the huddle. Then they become a missional community apprentice. Then they become a missional community leader. Then they become a missional community coach. Then they become an elder. And they would also even say um, in this elder that could become a planter that they send out or a lay or even a paid pastor. So you see uh, their strategy is a missional, they are a missional community based church. So their pathway fits their strategy. So that's really why I like their example. It's because they want you to, you know, you're responsible for one or two others that you're discipling, and then you're going to be apprenticing to become a leader of a group of 12 to 20 or so. As it says, responsible for 12 to 15 adults, all right? Um, but uh, we, we've kind of proven that a little bit. You, then you become a coach. And man, well, you, have, you have overseen five other small group leaders by pastoring them you, it's time for you to become a pastor of some capacity, whether it's a lay pastor or a paid pastor, okay? So I really like the Church of Cain Bay. I'll have this as a download for you. Uh, they gave it to me free, and our church, actually 121 Church, we use this as our template for our leadership pathway. So um, if I showed you the one from 121 where I was, actually I was walking through the pathway, it looks very similar to this, um, just a, a couple of different uh, uh, wording. But even here you see that they have how they're being developed. So uh, uh, a, a huddle leader is being developed by an MC leader. Uh, an MC apprentice is also being developed by an MC leader, um, but an MC coach is being developed by an elder. Okay, and so uh, it gives you what they're responsible for. You can see that there, um, how they're trained, who does their training, and also some recommended reading at each stage. You know, if you're going to become a missional community apprentice, they really want you to meet, uh, read the book uh, Community by Brad House. If you're in a missional community leader, they want you to read Everyday Church by Tim Chester and walk it through that through your coach. So, anyways, this is really good to have the reading and involved, who is responsible for what, what your role is. I really like their pathway. I really do a lot. Um, here's another example. Uh, this is from, I'm going to change my slide, Calvary Baptist in Winston. This is where I uh, was interning before moving to Calgary. This is a large church, about 3,000 members. They're in Winston-Salem, and uh, they're kind of going through a, a revitalization phase pro uh, process. I mentioned Rob Peters at the beginning, how he's kind of developing this training. So uh, let me give you a little bit of a disclaimer for this. Uh, so what I'm about to show you, um, it's kind of kind of, kind of, kind of weird to, to get, but anyways, what I'm about to show you is um, kind of their copyrighted version because uh, not that they don't want to share, it, they are actually building what they call their leadership ladder into a um, a training system called Refocus that's going to be mainly for North Carolina pastors who want to revitalize their struggling church. I think this would be really exciting for a lot of you who want to be a part of that. Uh, they're still working that out. They don't quite have all the resources put together, the training, but it's supposed to be starting here very soon. I think even late spring, early summer of this year. Um, they have what they call the leadership ladder. So what I'm going to ask you to do is uh, do not... Uh, um, uh, taking kind of screenshot of, of what I'm about to show you only because they're putting it into copyrighted uh, materials themselves. And the reason that and I, asked, I asked their permission before and they, they told me um, they would love for me to show the students, show you 
uh, what it looks like. They just don't want you to copy it down because they really would rather you go through their training to understand how to use it, not just take this PDF and say, hey, church, we're going to start you know, doing this leadership ladder without actually understanding how to use it. Okay, So they're really taking care of you by you not copying. So I'm asking you, don't take any screenshots. Uh, take some notes. If you want to t you know, type out the outline, that's completely fine because it's for uh, they say you can do that for this class. Just don't take a, a screenshot or anything. You won't have this as a download. So just view it. So this is the leadership ladder from Calvary. Um, as you see, it says uh, lay leaders, and so uh, they want a person. This is their disciple to apprentice to leader. So they they have it worded really neatly. I think um, they have. You start out at the bottom. You're leading yourself as a volunteer. So they want you to know Calvary's mission, vision, values, and strategy. And you see those bullet points. They give bullet points on okay, what does it look like? Kind of fleshing that out a little bit. Um, and they kind of have what they call passages, which the passage is saying okay, once someone is going to volunteer, they have to go through something to become a leader. Okay, so that first passage is kind of an apprenticeship time, uh, and now this is that's why they want you to go through their training and not just copy this down because they want to explain what that passage looks like for a person to go, not just a bunch of bullet points. If that makes sense, then the next passage, next thing they go is they start leading others. So they lead self, then they start leading others as a team leader. Okay, now they're living out Calvary's uh, mission, vision, strategy. They're leading some type of team, first impressions, or they're leading the coffee team and stuff like that. They're leading a, a nursery or a, a youth ministry class, or you know, leading something along those lines. Maybe an evangelism serving team or something else. But now they're leading other people, not just leading themselves. They're leading other people. And there's a passion they want you to go through. Then they want you to lead teams. That's that coach. Once you lead a team of um, of people, maybe you've had a heart for um, doing evangelism in low-income neighborhoods there in your city, and so this person has led one of those, but your church has four different initiatives in low-income areas, so now they're a coach overseeing the leaders of those four initiatives while they start out as just leading others. Now they're leading teams of multiple people, and then uh, there's a passage that gets them through, and now they become a coordinator. Okay, They're not just uh, coaching those teams. They're coordinating other aspects, and uh, they are now um, uh, really instrumental in assessing and raising up a lot more leaders and coaches. Now, this starts with laity, and they kind of expand it into staff. Okay, So you see we already have the first four, uh, four uh, things, the leading self, leading others, leading teams, leading leaders. Now they want you to start leading divisions. Now they can they can really bring this in because now you know they are a mega church, so they have these kind of divisions. But they want someone who can come in and be a lead strategist for their church planning initiative in Kenya. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that you let some teams, you coordinate some stuff, but now you are a strategist. You are you are developing those things. Uh, this would be kind of like that uh, uh, almost coach uh, director type level that we talked about. Um, and then they want you to become. They want you to lead a ministry. Now you become uh, the, a worship pastor or a missions pastor, you know, something along those lines. But now you become that catalyst role. So you um, see leading self, leading others, leading teams, leading leaders, leading divisions, and then leading a ministry. And so I really think this is a very uh, healthy example, especially for a large church. But I think you can, you can boil this down and really help people, especially with these first four. Uh, lead yourself as a volunteer, then lead others, become an apprentice, then lead other people, then lead teams, and then lead leaders. Okay, so it's really so. I want you to see that because uh, both of these examples really do um, uh, help you see. Now, these are two different churches who developed a leadership pipeline based on their church and what their church needs, the size of their church, the strategy, the church planning model, all those type of things went into. You can see how that fleshed out in their pipeline. Both of these are great examples, but they're not going to fit your church because your church is unique. It's different. Okay. Um, so as we close, here are some questions to think through. Does your leadership pipeline incorporate biblical foundations for church leadership? Are you looking at what the Bible ha says about uh, leaders, the biblical examples, the qualifications for elders and deacons, so forth? Are you incorporating those biblical foundations? Okay, Are you learning from them? Um, does your leadership uh, uh, pipeline fit with your church's core values? Okay, so if you value gospel centeredness, you value um, multiplying disciples, you know, all these things that you value as you go through your vision framework, uh, does it fit with your core values? All right. Um, does uh, your leadership uh, pipeline resonate with your context view of leadership? If you're in another country, 
um, leaders are uh, could be viewed very differently. It's not always the person that has the highest position. It might be the oldest person in the community is the leader, not the one who started three businesses or anything, but it's the person who's the oldest in age. All right, so that it all depends on what what context you go to. But listen to how leaders. Um, so in my context, the leader is usually the one who is courting volunteers, um, who uh, can kind of not really be out in front and say, "Hey, people, follow me." But a leader in Canada, especially in Calgary, is the person who gets in the middle of a group and drives it forward as a pack, not as in front of a group saying, hey, come follow me, if that makes any sense. So that's more of a cultural thing based on their government and socialism and, and whatnot. So we want our leadership pipeline to actually reflect what's happening uh, in the, the the mood of the understanding of leadership here in uh, Calgary. Um, does uh, your leadership pipeline compel people to progress? Do they actually want to look at that and say, oh, that, that's nice. I hope that's good for someone else. Or are they really compelled to say, you know what? I, c I could be a, a coach one day. I could be a leader one day. I, I could be a pastor or a catalyst one day. Does it compel people uh, to progress forward? Um, and lastly, does your leadership pipeline clearly outline how one progresses from one stage to the next. The the passages that we saw in Calvary's example, do, does a person know how do they become a uh, an apprentice after being a disciple? How do they become a leader? So this is really where it's uh, key for you as a church leader, as a pastor, uh, to work with the other leaders and say, okay, how are we going to outline and describe, okay, when you're a disciple, we want you know to become an apprentice, you apply for it or you mention it, whatever it is, but let people clearly know, I go from here and here's how I get to the next step. Here is what they want. Just like uh, Calvary here has um, these kind of bullet points um, that are kind of characteristics that you, you know, as you go through these passages, if they don't see these characteristics in you, then you're not going to progress to the next level. He's just not ready yet. You need a little bit more mentoring or training or coaching. Here from uh, Kane Bay, you know, they have here uh, what they want you to do, how you're being developed, what you're responsible for. So they clearly laid out what it is they want you to do. So I think that's just really important. Make it very clear and simple for people to follow. Make it compelling. Uh, at the end of the day, the goal is how can you help multiply leaders as in you're, you're establishing your church, but establish this leadership pipeline. Map it out. Print it out so people can see it, they can touch it, and you can start going to the individuals in your church and say, hey, you can walk through this. You can become this. Now, they may not become, um, you know, like we uh, mentioned here in our big, they may not become a catalyst. You may get someone, and for 30 years, they uh, kind of stay at that leader role, and that's where they're really good. That's okay. You know, it's not to get every single person through a catalyst, but it is to get every single person progressing somehow. Okay, I think all should at least become a leader of something, whether it's church or you send them out in a church planning team to be a leader with that other one. Okay, so it all depends on spiritual gifting, calling, all those sort of things. Um, so, anyways, I'm out of breath. Sorry, this was a long lecture, but I hope that was helpful for you because this has really been just huge for us to think through um, as a new church plan. I hope it helps you, uh, whether you're planting, revitalizing, replanting, uh, or just trying to strengthen and grow uh, your existing church or ministry.